Yeah, thank you very much, Ace, for the for the welcome. Yeah, um, my name is Martin German. Together with Reiko Tsubaki and Bert Winter Tamaki, I curated the second anniversary show, the 20th anniversary of Mori Art Museum. And today uh, is the second learning event in the course of this exhibition. And I'd like to very briefly tell you a little bit about the exhibition for those who haven't seen it yet. Um, it's in the larger framework that uh, the ICOM, the Museum Association, has also added sustainability to museum rules. And for, for Mori, that was very important, of course, also from that perspective, to think about what is today considered as a global climate crisis, uh, environmental crisis. And uh, we tried to make an, we made an exhibition with 34 artists from 16 countries uh, and over four chapters this exhibition unfolds to make us understand the roles artists can take on in challenging the climate crisis, in reading the climate crisis, in understanding it more and better. And the first chapter is called All Connected. There we can see how uh, artists make us aware of the fact that constantly materials, ideas, things circulate around this planet some are stimulated by human beings, some are not. So there's a lot of circulation we are surrounded by. Then the second chapter is called Return to Earth. This is why we're here tonight. This is um, an, an environmental art history of how artists in Japan were reacting to the fact that the economic boom time had a, uh, had a downside in the fact that the pollution was extremely high. And uh, we made this chapter because we wanted to have, we wanted to show in the exhibition that the global environmental crisis has many different local beginnings and to, in industrialized countries around the world, such as Germany or also Japan. And to, to understand it better, we also need to understand better what happened locally, also for the future. Then comes a third part which is called the Great Acceleration. So these processes, which we, uh, which already started in the 50s to the 80s, they just accelerated. I think the half of all fossil uh, on this planet was burned in the last 25 years, which is, of course, remarkable. The population has doubled. Statistics just grew up in all respects. About this we can learn in the third chapter of the exhibition, whereas the last chapter, uh, it's called The Future is in Us. And because there will always be a future, this planet exists with or without us. This is no question at all. But of course, uh, as human beings, we should think about how we could uh, consider the planet not only as a resource, but also as something to coexist with. And there are uh, artistic ideas from covering artificial intelligence, but also indigenous technologies, which were very long suppressed by uh, industrialization. It's actually these circular economies and cradle-to-cradle -cradle economies these people are absolutely capable of. And uh, we also learn about collect collective intelligence and, uh, and other, um, not solutions, but perspectives uh, how artists, which artists, about the roles artists can take on in this process, which, um, yeah, I think is important for everyone who's living on uh, Earth at the moment. And, um, yeah, I'm very, very happy that Bert Winter Tamaki, who um, published a book recently about Tsuchi, about the role of Earth for Japanese artists, that he helped us out in... Uh, creating this uh, environmental art history, which we also see as a paradigm. We hope that other museums will follow and maybe looking through the lens of ecology into art history once more. It can bring up fascinating artists we haven't heard of and new perspectives. And uh, to give his lecture now, I would to uh, welcome Bert Wintertamaki, who is professor at the University of California in Irvine. And um, he will present his research and also this uh, 
chapter which he uh, which kind of put in the middle of our exhibition which is like a burning glass all the global conflicts are there um, you can see them how they started in Japan so welcome Bert and um, yeah let's get started Um, uh, hello, hello, everybody. Is this on? Is it on? Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. It's really wonderful to to see you uh, here. I'm. Uh, it's an honor to um, have been uh, asked to guest curate this section of the exhibition. Um, and before I start, I want to thank. Uh, uh, all the, the people that, that became my colleagues over the past year in uh, putting this, this exhibition together, um, including Kataoka Mami-san and uh, Tokuyama Hirokazu and Martin German and um, uh, Tsubaki Reiko and Oyamada Yoko and Shiraki Eisei. Um, and I also especially want to thank the uh, artists um, uh, and I think uh, three of them are, are here today. Um, I'm very grateful to Nakaya Fujiko and uh, to Taniguchi Gaho and to Nagasawa Nobuho. Um, <clears throat> so I was guest curator of section two of the exhibition. And this exhibition, this section contains 20 objects. And um, these 20 objects, mostly by uh, 20 different artists, they, they tell a story. And what I would like to do now is try to tell that story by showing uh, pictures of those objects and uh, using more words now than you will find in the exhibition itself. Um, so, uh, what is the story that emerges from the weaving together of these 20 objects? It's a story that I have called Return to Earth, Tsuchi ni Kaeru. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, a drawn from the title of a work of art by uh, Koye Ryoji. Uh, it is his title for this work of art. And uh, there are three senses of the term return to earth that I think are especially valuable for us to think about here. Um, the, the first, and they're, and they're embodied, interestingly, in this work of art itself. So um, uh, how do bodies return to the earth? and not just bodies of humans and um, animals and plants, but also uh, objects, the things that people make and the residues that emerge from their lives. So in this work of art, the, uh, the return to earth is double, double. It uh, involves the artist making a mold impression of his own face in and impressing it onto a uh, pile of uh, uh, sand on the right on the beach and on the left a material called sherban which is um excuse me sherban which is a actually it's made from porcelain sanitary porcelains like sinks and toilets that are ground into powder. Uh, so that causes not only the body of the artist to return to earth, but also these manufactured objects as they are ground into Sherban. And the work on the left, which is in the exhibition, is fixed. But the work, uh, the, the version, and he did many versions on the right, is um, going to be dispersed by the wind very soon after the, this photograph was uh, taken. So um, uh, how do humans and other bodies 
return to Earth? It's an essential question for ecology. How are they reabsorbed into ecosystems? Um, but there's a very different second sense uh, that I'm also concerned with here, and that is uh, the return to Earth as a way of trying to bypass echo anxieties and um, the feeling that the urbanized industrial environment is, uh, is constricting uh, of life. And this prompts a desire to come into contact with something like earth, uh, something like water or fire. Um, a, as a way to rejuve, rejuvenate the term kigen ni kaeder, return to origins, that when you touch soil, you're not just getting your hands dirty, you're, you're, you're returning to origins is one of the thoughts here. But there's a third sense of returning to the earth that I think is also important, and this comes from the French philosopher Bruno Latour, who passed away just last year, and wrote a book called Down to Earth, Chikyu ni Oritatsu. Uh, and uh, he, 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 one of the things he says in this book is whether you're a Wall Street banker or soil bacteria or bird flying in the sky, you belong to the earth, but the earth doesn't belong to you. And, uh, and, and this earth is just a biofilm around the, glo uh, the, the, the planet, uh, just a few kilometers between bedrock and the atmosphere. Um, so uh, he, he counsels, he advises us to inventory uh, the terrestrials, whether they're soil biota or Wall Street bankers, and to, um, uh, to uh, talk, to investigate their interdependence. So that's another sense of return to Earth. What I did is try to organize these 20 objects in groupings. And the groupings involve a historicity and a uh, focus on media and some relation to the environment. So these four groupings are roughly in chronological order, starting with the 50s, when uh, oil on canvas was a, uh, still a very important medium, um, and then moving to uh, uh, protests of the uh, terrible industrial pollution problems in the 1960s and 70s, and focusing on the very different media of photojournalism, satirical graphics, and video, then moving to uh, conceptual sculpture, and finally, elemental materialities in installation. So section two of the exhibition is roughly organized this way, and now I will proceed uh, through these 20 objects uh, roughly in, in this or order as well. The objective here is to outline something like a uh, environmental art history of post-war Japan. Um, this is just the beginning, but I think that a lot of uh, work can be done in this area and many more objects than just the 20 that I have selected uh, have interesting roles in this history. Um, it's, it's not, uh, I'm, this isn't the first time that somebody has called attention to this history. Um, and at various points during this period, uh, people were alert to uh, the uh, stakes involved. One of the most perceptive was the artist Kudo Tetsumi, whose work is included in the show. And in 1974, he made the very sobering uh, comment that um, the Japanese people are like a lab rat of the world, moromoto, or guinea pig. And he, he mentioned four benchmarks, the atomic radiation, uh, the industrial pollution 
which in the uh, 70s was sometimes said to be the worst in the world in Japan. And the uh, economic animal, the devotion of people to uh, production and capitalism. And fourthly, the, uh, the, the saturation of society by uh, monopoly mass media. Those four, in, in Kudo's opinion, in 1974, uh, made Japan to be an extraordinary test case that was uh, essential for the entire world to, uh, to pay attention to. So um, uh, the, uh, in 1954, on March 1st, the American military detonated a hydrogen bomb in the Bikini Atoll of the Marshall Islands that was supposed to be uh, a seven megatons, but it was 15 megatons. Extraordinarily powerful uh, detonation and it, um, it, uh, it, it dropped uh, uh, white ash, radiation uh, filled uh, white ash that came to be called uh, death ash, Shinohai, uh, all over a vast section of the Pacific Ocean. And at this time, um, the uh, boat on the left, the uh, Lucky Dragon number five boat was, um, uh, was in that vicinity, and the 23 fishermen aboard were contaminated and contracted radiation sickness. And this uh, turned into a scandal. Um, people were worried about the uh, contamination of the food supply with radiation, especially the fish. Um, and, uh, and so the fears uh, of what this, uh, what this both the, what the future held were, um, uh, were uh, led to an anti-nuclear movement. So there are two works in the exhibition that, um, uh, that foreground an artistic response to this horrific event. The first one is a painting by Katsura Yuki, um, which in a manner of speaking is an image of one of these fishermen although it's quite abstract. And what, what happens in this painting is that the human body is intermingled with the fish that seem to be uh, swimming inside. Um, but on the upper right, there is a Tromp Loy uh, painting of Shimenawa. A, a small kind of a, a rope ornament used in Shinto uh, shrines to designate a space, a sacred space, a pure space. But in this painting, ironically, it's precisely the opposite because it's an impure, contaminated space that invades the integrity of the body itself. Um, uh, so, um, this, this was one, one image of the, in that idiom of 1950s Japanese oil painting that kind of had uh, very abstract qualities and realistic qualities kind of merged together in a humorous way. Okamoto Taro, of course, super famous artist from this period, he also created a uh, painting that was a response to the Lucky Dragon incident. But it's uh, the contrast between his uh, painting and Katsura's is very striking. Whereas she seems to be uh, showing the loss of the subject. The subject is dissolving. The, sub the human subject may be a fisherman. Uh, Okamoto seems to be um, indulging in the spectacle of the, the flames of the uh, explosion, of the nuclear explosion. Even though he has, uh, can you see my, yeah, there, he has included a small lucky dragon boat, even a couple of fish, uh, but the mushroom cloud is given strange eyes 
and uh, it's kind of a serpent, and the uh, flames are very dramatically um, exaggerated. So uh, in this painting was actually displayed at the Fifth World Conference Against Hydrogen and Atomic Bombs in 1959. And Okamoto has been uh, associated with an anti-nuclear point of view. Um, so the, there is that side, but there is another side, which is a kind of uh, excitement about the energy uh, that is released by this extraordinary technology. And there's also a psychological uh, side. He, um, uh, he uh, wrote about um, the monster, the atomic psyche, as something that lurks within us, uh, consciously or unconsciously, that involves uh, fear and dread and premonition of the future. And he, he, he seemed to think there was a cathartic value in um, releasing that energy from the unconscious in this kind of display. And uh, some 15 years later, he would paint the enormous mural at Shibuya Station, which um, uh, plays with the same thematic and motifs. So moving from the medium of oil painting to this next section is a dramatic move, takes us to very serious photojournalism. Uh, uh, not really artworks. Um, some of the photographers would object to that rubric because they were seeking to um, advance a political cause rather than personal artistic expression. Uh, so this is a photo book um, uh, by Hayashi Eidai uh, and his, and his uh, uh, students, which involved um, uh, uh, answering uh, the, the question, that is the subtitle, what legacy will be left for children? But even more than that, um, introducing the phenomena of pollution. The, the main title is, this is pollution. And the photographs vis visualize the new uh, phenomena of pollution. So here, here you see Beijing, this um, spewing out of the uh, chimneys of smoke, soot, and fly ash, and particulate matter. And here you see hedoro, a term which became uh, frequently used in this period which was actually a portmanteau word combining the word for vomit and mud and referred basically to sludge that had some kind of industrial pollution mixed in it. And here it is being spewed out of some pipes into the environment. And some of that baijing, that particulate matter, has uh, rained down uh, black rain, uh, black powder, and accumulated along the contours of electrical wires and created these icicle-like uh, formations on the wires. So um, the book uh, introduces these and it is accompanied by a text by uh, Hayashi Eidai who um, focuses on the area where he and his family were living, the highly industrialized area of Kitakyushu. Uh, and he um, uh, explains how it basically became impossible to live there. And he had to move his family away from that area. And he um, makes the point, uh, he reasons, if somebody takes a gun and shoots so, uh, uh, some, a victim, that is called homicide. And that is criminal and is punished by law. And the same is true for these factories that are killing people in the environment. So uh, these works are um, dedicated to the political cause of uh, ending pollution. This was an extraordinary project by the All Japan Student Photographers Association, which had 
hundreds of measure, members all over uh, Japan who uh, went out and took pictures of environmental problems throughout the archipelago. Uh, then they, they came together in a big conference and they selected the photographs that would be published in this 88 page photo book. Uh, and um, the title is, We Have No Country on This Land. Uh, uh, quite an extraordinary statement, which comes from um, the, the great pioneering environmentalist of the Meiji period, Tanaka Shouzo, who gave a speech in the Diet in 1900 opposing the Ashio, uh, uh, Ashio mine pollution in Tochigi Prefecture. You open the booklet, and on page two, it says, uh, this book was not made for viewing. Uh, quite, quite interesting when you open a photo book and it says, if you're looking at it, put it down and get out and go to the rallies and oppose pollution. And that's what we're doing too. Uh, so uh, there's a kind of uh, political energy that was invested in this book. The photographs include images like this, a very painful uh, photograph. We've I've been discussing it with colleagues and we kind of think that it is the image of a person lying down their head off to the right and we're seeing their, their back uh, and maybe uh, somebody else's hand. Uh, the back is, is covered with these horrible blisters and this is a person who consumed uh, food oil from the Kanemi Corporation which was contaminated by uh, organochlorine um, and caused uh, this, this terrible uh, illness. Here are two more pictures. So again, we're, we're seeing the emergence of a stock vocabulary of pollution. And I'm assuming that uh, this is a transnational phenomenon and that there are going to be counterparts in uh, many parts of the world. Um, uh, another, another kind of typical repeated image is the combinato, the uh, refinery, which is kind of like this mechanical multi-headed torch that is uh, thrusting, um, that's spewing out all kinds of pollutants into the atmosphere. Here is a tile roof that has been uh, covered with layers of this um, baijin once again that have now cemented across the entire uh, roof and caused the roof to malfunction and leak and, and break. Moving now um, to yet another medium. Uh, these are uh, satirical graphics. So unlike the photojournalism that we were just looking at that were very serious and very objective in a way, uh, these are uh, uh, photo montages. It's a kind uh, uh, of form in art history sometimes referred to with the French word detournement, uh, a kind of twisting of a pre-existing image and inflecting it with a political, uh, often a radical political uh, kind of ideology. So the, the given image that was subjected to the process of detournement is this photograph uh, on the calendar by Shirakawa Yoshikazu that shows um, skiers uh, on this ski slope in the mountains in Austria. And it was on this calendar for the American International Underwriters. Um, so Mad Amano, uh, the, the art name of Amano uh, uh, Masa, Masakazu, I think, um, he took a tire from an advertisement for Bridgestone tires and he uh, noticed very smartly, he noticed how the slalom uh, path uh, of the skiers sort of rhymed with the wavy treads of the snow tire and he placed this tire in a ominous, colossal scale, looming above 
and it seems like it's going to crush the ant-like skiers below. This uh, went to court because Shirakawa sued Med Amano for using his photograph without copyright permission. So it was a lengthy uh, court case. And in his defense, in court, Med Amano argued that this work is a satirical critique of the current situation of pollution from automobiles. So um, uh, this uh, photo montage is delivering a, uh, a critique that found an audience in the venue of a court of law. Here is another detournement that is a um, that uses what was an image from um, the I think the largest uh, uh, advertising campaign in Japanese history that was created by the Dentsu Corporation in 1970 and was called Discover Japan uh, and was an advertisement for Japanese national railways, uh, basically. Uh, appealing to young women to um, leave behind their uh, industrialized, urbanized environments and get on a train and go s discover some of the remaining parts of Japan that might seem to be yet uh, unaffected by pollution and industrialization and, uh, and so on. So here you see one of those many, many images produced by this 10-year-long campaign that shows a woman who uh, seems to be getting in touch with nature by raking some leaves. And Hirata Minoru came along and he used precisely the same uh, copy, Discover Japan, the logo, and we even see uh, Mount Fuji in the distance, and we see the uh, bullet train there zooming along. Um, but uh, instead of the um, uh, woman whose uh, access to nature is mediated by tourism, now we see um, a, a kind of stony-faced doll. And she um, it presents herself in front of Tagonora Bay. And this is a, a bay with great pictorial, historical, uh, picturesque significance. In the 1830s, Hokusai uh, made one of his 36 views of Mount Fuji with the view of Tagonura Bay. But here it is covered with hedoro, with sludge. Uh, and so that phrase, here it was um, uh, me and beautiful Japan. And here it is me and beautiful Tagonura Bay, which is not beautiful anymore. So. Uh, satirical graphics. Here is another uh, artist, y y another photo montage, Kimura Tsunehisa. And this artist was also theoretically very sophisticated. And he, um, he talked about image pollution, uh, imeji kolgai. Uh, so it, it, it's not just things like hedoro or sludge, but it's also the media that he was um, pointing to. And here, as you can see, society is uh, satiated with um, so much uh, media that the comic books and uh, recycled newspapers and magazines are uh, monumentalized in the architectural form. Here, another photo montage by Kimura Tsunehisa, um, which uh, is a very interesting uh, way of undermining the logic of the waste stream. So normally we, we go to Ginza, this is Skiabashi, and we buy something, a commodity uh, at a expensive store, and we take it home and we use it. And when it's uh, broken or all used up, we throw it away and the waste is carted off to some landfill where we don't see it. So what uh, Kimura does here is reverse that flow so that instead of being carted off to a landfill where we don't see it, it's returned to the site of purchase. And it now 
turns the, uh, empo the, these retail emporia into a large uh, dump. Um, and this is an, another media that dealt with uh, these problems of pollution, but it was a new media at this time. Um, this is uh, Nakaya Fujiko's Friends of Minamata Victims video diary from 1972. So the Minamata disease was caused by factories in Kumamoto Prefecture, which produced uh, methyl mercury that polluted the bay and uh, was consumed by fish and shellfish, which in turn were consumed by uh, people that lived in that area, and they became very ill from the mercury poisoning. Um, so this went on for many years. The company denied responsibility, and uh, some of the patients and, the, uh, uh, and, and demonstrators set up a tent city in Tokyo in front of the headquarters building of the Chiso Corporation. And Nakaya-san took her uh, portable video, which was a new technology at this time, and she went to that site and videoed these people. Um, and the unique property of video that was very novel at this time was immediate feedback. So like the, um, uh, the television monitor that we have in our exhibition, there was a monitor on the site and they are watching themselves. So there is a feedback where they can see themselves in such a way that it has an impact on their subsequent behavior at the same site. This is a highly significant uh, experimental uh, moment in media history where you start to see an intervention in the monopoly of the uh, corporate mass media with a media that is now in control of uh, people that are disempowered. A very uh, significant work. In the third grouping, there is a, um, uh, uh, th there are uh, uh, two sculptures that I have called uh, perverse ecologies. And each of these sculptures, uh, this one, 1968, they, um, they, they evoke some kind of ecosystem. But an ecosystem, of course, is of value because it sustains life. Uh, and these ecosystems seem to do just the opposite. They seem to be uh, promoting death or something very close to it. So this is a work by Kudo Tetsumi. Uh, and uh, you can see very uh, bright fluorescent colors. And you look through the uh, plastic and you can see strange nose and transistors and eyeballs. Um, so uh, Kudo theorized something that he called new ecology. And some of his works are, are, have that rubric in the title. New Ecology, a cultivation by radiation, where he started to think that the human, the nature, and here he calls it conquered nature, is starting to take its revenge on humanity. The human, this um, nature, uh, pollution, electronics, machines, they're all... Uh, in the new ecology, they're all mutating. They're all interfering, intermingling, and decomposing one another. Uh, so that is the scenario that he evokes. And I urge you to look inside uh, closely um, to see the strange slug-like nose that's crawling up the wall uh, and has mossy nostrils and the eyeballs and the transistors. So uh, this, this is a conceptual sculpture. Uh, it evokes an ecosystem that is uh, very poisoned, but um, it's a representation of an ecosystem or of a system rather than a system itself. 
And artists at this period, in this period, were actually starting to create systems as artworks. Not just representations of systems, but actual systems. And the exhibition starts with Hans Hake, who did uh, very famously and influentially did just that. Uh, the work on the right is uh, a work that likewise actually creates a system that functions apart from whatever uh, the viewer might think about it. So uh, in this work, in this work, maggots are uh, placed inside the glass funnel on the upper right. Maggots are uh, inserted into this tube and they enter inside this steel box. And inside this box, there's a 20 watt light bulb that generates some heat. And these maggots, uh, as they enter inside this unseen space, except for a very small aperture, a little window on the top, right up there. Inside this box, the maggots mature to adult flies and they buzz around the heat and light of the light bulb. Uh, but there is no nutrition for them inside this environment. Um, they cannot survive beyond the initial energy that they bring with them in their bodies in, as, uh, as maggots. Uh, so uh, they then uh, die and their bodies then um, dribble out of this pipe on the lower left and accumulate in the pan uh, on the floor. Um, and during the 24 days when this system was operating from June 15th, you see it's written on this wall, to July 8th, exactly 385 bodies accumulated in the tray below. So the, the artist said, and you can see in this quote here, that um, he wanted to uh, somehow uh, appreciate uh, or ascertain these things that, that, that have no shape, such as sound or light. And in this case, uh, energy, the energy. So it's very odd to, to think of those flies uh, flying around the light bulb as a kind of energy for the duration of life. And, and, and then their, their carcasses in the tray, uh, the 385 dead flies as being an odd uh, sort of measure, uh, each body a unit of measure of that ungraspable kind of, of energy. So um, a, a, very, uh, a very dark uh, kind of perverse kind of uh, sculpture, and Ken Yoshida, in a very important book called The Avant-Garde uh, Avant Art and Non-Dominant Thought in Post-War Japan, has um, written about this as a black box of death, a very violent kind of sculpture that nonetheless evokes this system as something that is, is locked away in this box outside of uh, human intervention. So in the last room in section two, there are uh, works of art that I have grouped under this rubric of elemental materialities. And um, in, in Japanese, we've, we've translated that as yondai gen sono bushitsu. So the four Empedoclean elements of uh, earth, uh, water, uh, fire, and air. Uh, once again, there was this sense that in the environment that was urbanized and industrialized and often contaminated or polluted, that, that if, you could, if you could only come in contact with the elements that you could then bypass the echo and anxieties that are a product of this uh, contemporary environment. Uh, so one of the forms that this took 
was uh, field firing. And Fujita Akito, in 1975, she uh, had been making a lot of ceramics, which are uh, only as big as the interior of the kiln will allow. But with field firing, you can make it as large as you want, or as much clay as you can find. So um, noyaki is a unique combination of all four Empedoclean elements because the clay is the earth that is kneaded with water and it is fire, uh, the fire, and the fire requires oxygen or air in order to burn. So um, this was a very, um, uh, very uh, idealistic gesture toward uh, uh, unity, a kind of unity of the self with the environment and these very primordial uh, basic kinds of materialities. Um, th this we have in the gallery a maquette uh, and also a video that, um, that, that shows the artist and her, uh, her, her uh, followers, the red shirt group, uh, they were all wearing red shirts, and they built this as a kind of a community project. And watch the video carefully, an extraordinary ritual where they are dancing and wearing costumes and drinking and singing and chanting. Uh, so there was a sort of romance of uh, a, a kind of primitive way of coming back to the earth here in this ritual. Um, and here, uh, Yoshida Yoshie, the critic, uh, was referring to that ritual. Um, uh, so in the Jomon period, uh, very ancient prehistory uh, in Japan, uh, pottery was made without kilns, noyaki. And here she was seen, that's, that's Fujita herself, um, as a kind of uh, a Jomon woman possessed by the gods. Next year, she went to Idenawa uh, in, near Hiratsuka in Kanagawa Prefecture, and she expanded this to enormous dimensions. It's a fascinating hybrid, uh, a hybrid combination of ceramics, of sculpture, of architecture, and performance. And the fires got so large that the fire department came. Uh, and um, here you can see Fujita Akiko writing in the Bijutsu Techo art magazine, the fire opened its huge red mouth of voracious desire and I burned too, burned and burned. So there was this kind of experience of ecstasy involved in the, uh, in the return to earth with projects like this. And uh, in 1984, Nagasawa Nobuho went to uh, Tokoname, this ancient pottery town, and she made another incredible uh, work in Noyaki. Uh, in fact, she, the title is also Noyaki, but she was much more interested uh, not in the ceramic kind of field firing as much as the agricultural kind of field firing, which is an ancient technique of burning away the old unwanted growth and refertilizing the uh, soil that is uh, practiced to this day, uh, practiced also in Tokoname, the, the rural area around this pottery village. Um, so uh, she built an extraordinary um, uh, 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 mountain-like uh, 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 object of very rough uh, uh, mud and seawater and momigara, this uh, rice chaff, um, and set it into uh, on fire. Another enormous fire. In fact, in this case, um, uh, the fire was so big, we, we learn, that it caused a kind of black rain. And one of the people there uh, observed that this black rain almost seemed like a, uh, the black rain of Hiroshima. 
uh, which is very significant. Many of the theorists of fire, of fire itself, talk about fire as a phenomenon that is highly ambiguous, uh, that includes cooking, the hearth, and the allure of reverie as you stare into the beautiful fire, the sacred flames. At the same time, it's associated with the flames of hell and terrible destruction and war and weaponry. So um, this is fascinating the way uh, both sides come into some works. And that happened again um, when uh, uh, Nagasawa-san went to Berlin. And there was a site that in the horrible events of Kristallnacht in 1938, in Berlin, uh, a synagogue was destroyed by the Nazis. And this destroyed not, uh, synagogue site lay fallow from 1938 until 1984. There were the bones of the victims. Uh, there were, there were uh, spent shells and uh, uh, weapons there. And um, this fire, this noyaki, was burned as a way to remediate the toxicity of this site. And then in a, uh, with a remarkable title, um, the, it was called Navel of the Earth. This uh, evokes an embryological motif that the famous uh, religious studies scholar Mircho Eliade uh, talked about ancient sites uh, in many parts of the world where there was a kind of omphalos or navel uh, also related to the myth of the Axis Mundi, which is a sort of elevator-like cosmogony where there's a vertical kind of continuity between the dead below ground and the heavens and the uh, humans on the earth surface. Um, so uh, this uh, what fire was burned as a way to take this poisonous site and um, uh, purify it. Uh, and uh, was ultimately successful in that it became a uh, park, which I believe it still is today. Um, here we see a quote where um, Nagasawa-san said she wanted to do this in many other places around the world um, uh, to turn uh, desolate spaces into oases. Tonoshiki Tadashi, um, uh, now in 1985, an artist in the, uh, working in the Yamaguchi area, who was originally from uh, the Hiroshima area, he um, uh, gravitated in the mid 80s toward an obsessive practice of gathering plastic and burning it. So once again, we're talking about fire, but this time plastic. And plastic is of course not a elemental material. Uh, it, quite the contrary, plastic is uh, uh, this material that is horrible for the uh, environment because it takes so long tens of thousands of years to, um, uh, to degrade into, uh, to recycle into ecosystems. So Tonoshiki was himself a hibaksha, a victim of Hiroshima radiation. He was born in 1942. His mother took him in 1945 to Hiroshima in search of his father, his father uh, uh, was nowhere to be found. He was killed instantly by the bomb. And uh, his mother absorbed enough radiation that she would then die uh, when he was eight years old. And Tonoshiki himself uh, experienced radiation sickness and would die uh, uh, at age 50. Um, so in this uh, gathering of plastic, uh, he, he, uh, he said, I don't remember it, he's referring to Hiroshima in 1945, 
when he was three years old, too young to remember. I don't remember it, but the burned out wasteland that I saw at that time is probably remembered by this body. By burning trash, it seems I can confirm the unconscious memory. So this burning of plastic uh, was a kind of therapeutic uh, activity, practice for Tonoshiki. However, uh, as he um, dug these holes in the yard right next to his studio, adjacent to a rice paddy, and filled them with different kinds of plastic, melted it down, making uh, strange plastic sculptures. He was absorbing toxins. To burn plastic is to release dioxin and all kinds of other uh, fumes that are extremely hazardous to health. Uh, so um, uh, I can't help but worry about him in these works of art and wonder about how conscious he was of that or whether he was deliberately disregarding it. But he did um, uh, then expand this into a social project. So he, was, um, uh, he went to Germany and he was uh, greatly impacted by the, uh, the extremely influential uh, uh, work by the German artist Josef Beuys called 7,000 Oaks, major environmental art project. So he was uh, influenced by that, came back to Japan, and he, um, he organized this event. He put out a flyer asking for volunteers. Uh, thought maybe 50 or so would come to the beach and help him gather up plastic trash, and 130 came. And they spent all day on this beach down in Yamaguchi Prefecture, where uh, plastic trash and trash and other materials had washed ashore from Siberia, from Korea, from the, the coast of China, from other parts of Japan. They dug a huge hole with a crane, a backhoe, and they threw all this uh, trash uh, into the hole and doused it with uh, fuel and uh, lit it on fire. So it turned into a big uh, flaming soup uh, where all of the plastic uh, melted. And as it melted, it then um, it seeped into the soil, the sandy soil walls and bottom of the pit. And then uh, they threw seawater on top of it to put out the fire, the flames. And as it cooled, it, it fused. It bound. Uh, these materials were agglutinated together. Uh, and then um, uh, you can see they attached this big uh, rebar hook and then hoisted it up with the crane. And look at the video in the gallery. You can see. The people really seem to be astonished at the moment when this two-ton object, uh, still uh, fuming with smoke and dripping with water, is, is rising out of the rising out of the earth like a like a monster, and um, they're all uh, amazed by the sheer materiality of this uh, of this project. And that um, was placed on the uh, veranda, the plaza of the Hiroshima City Museum. And Tonoshiki said, don't preserve it, just leave it there, let it erode from the wind and the rain. And, and gradually it has, it has done just that. Uh, you, you can see it here, uh, here in detail. And this um, is, is a kind of material that subsequently, about 15 years after this work, would come to be called plastiglomerate. And this was, a, uh, was, was discovered on the beach in Hawaii, where lots of people had made bonfires. And burned plastic had just kind of uh, settled into the sand. And there was a lot of this uh, burned plastic left there. Um, and so it was uh, determined, it was uh, 
it, it, was, it, it was dubbed a mineral. This is a new mineral. Uh, the future fossils of the Anthropocene, plastic. Uh, so, you know, as you look at the details, you can recognize some bits of plastic. Others have chipped away into microplastics that are another huge environmental problem. Uh, but some have still consolidated, as you see here, this kind of um, uh, mineralogical, geological uh, formation. So, I thought of this uh, two-ton object uh, as the kind of pièce de résistance for the exhibition, that it would, that would stand as a, uh, as a memento mori, uh, that it would stand in front of the uh, window overlooking the uh, city of Tokyo in the, the gallery, uh, the sort of uh, grand finale of, the, uh, of section two. But um, these exhibitions, and I learned thanks to my collaborators, they're a very, uh, you, there's a discovery process and some things happen along the way that are unanticipated. And one of the things that happened was uh, that we, well, we asked um, uh, Taniguchi Gaho-san to uh, recreate a work of Ikebana that she had done in the 1980s. And she did amazing works in the 1980s that involved flipping the art of flower arranging so that instead of looking at flowers and leaves, you look at what you normally can't see under the ground, the roots and often the earth and uh, seeds and these materials. So um, she said about uh, uh, create, re reconstructing a work from uh, this period, but along the way, it uh, emerged into something rather different, uh, still similar in other ways, uh, but larger than we expected, and it then became uh, a, a, a somewhat more optimistic grand finale to the exhibition, uh, a little bit closer to the window overlooking Tokyo than um, then uh, Tonoshiki's uh, work, and uh, he, here it is, and she gave it the title uh, Sprouting with the Question Mark, and though as, the, as though answering the question, uh, please with an exclamation point. And here, once again, you see uh, uh, many roots of corn plants um, uh, projecting from this uh, roughly bell-shaped object, uh, along with husks of corn. If you look carefully, you can see a lot of seeds, um, a, a, a very earthy kind of, of object, um, uh, an object that uh, evokes the kind uh, uh, reflections on the status of plants in the world today in um, a new study of uh, plant life um, by Michael Martyr just published by MIT Press, called uh, Entangled Vegetation. Um, there is the observation of deforestation that is, I'm amazed. I think I want to do some fact checking, but if they're right, it says that every minute, uh, a, a, an area about the size of 36 football fields filled with trees is deforested every minute, which has devastating consequences because uh, at the same time, 130 species of plants and insects and animals are uh, disappearing uh, uh, every day, I think it is, um, due to deforestation. And deforestation is responsible for 20% of greenhouse gases. So these very sobering kinds of uh, uh, aspects of the problems with uh, sustained plant life uh, in our time. There's also a new book called Plant Life by the uh, Italian philosopher Emanuele Cocci. And he says, he, one chapter is about roots. It makes me think of this work. Or this work makes me think of what he said, that uh, the roots 
have a kind of uh, spiritual brain underground where all these mineralogical uh, transactions through roots create a, uh, a, a global kind of, of network. So um, I think some of these, these thoughts are evoked by this work. Uh, at the same time, it has seeds. And um, uh, Taniguchi-san told me that some of these seeds on the window side of this, of this work are likely to sprout uh, because the sun, uh, the sun will strike that side. And um, maybe there is a note of optimism that we can draw from, uh, from this work of art. So um, uh, those are most of the 20 uh, works in the show. And my feeling at this point after the show has been installed and after thinking about it more and writing about it a bit and talking to you folks about it is that there's a lot more that can be done with the environmental art history of post-war Japan. I want to do more, and I look forward to what others uh, are going to do as well. But um, one next step uh, that I have taken is to um, uh, convene a seminar at my home university, at the University of California. Uh, and I now have 15 students who are uh, each working on one of these objects. They're researching. They're, they, they, don't, they don't read Japanese, so uh, their vision is necessarily limited in some ways, but they're eager to interpret these works, um, and they're uh, reading uh, interdisciplinarily uh, and coming up with their own um, uh, views. And we're coming back on December 15th in this room, I think, uh, and we're going to... Um, uh, we're going to uh, talk about these works, and I, I hope that some of you uh, or some of your students from uh, Tokyo can um, uh, join us that day. Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for this incredibly interesting and deep lecture, which was in itself so interesting, but also beautifully showed the many connections from the Japanese art history to the rest of the exhibition. Like you can make a connection from Kudo to Pierre Wieck or to uh, Tanashiki. And so this is quite interesting how that gets together. Um, nevertheless, we, we would like to ask you a few questions and then later we will open to the audience. And... Um, so how, how, how did your relation to Japan actually, how, how did that come? Uh, yeah, I sometimes tell this, tell this story. Um, I, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania and we, we had to, um, everybody in that uh, uh, freshman had to study a foreign language and I didn't know what language to study. And in those days, the course of studies bulletin was printed. Um, and uh, I liked uh, the artist Marcel Duchamp, who uh, practiced chance operations. So I closed my eyes and I opened the book and pointed. Um, and it landed, my finger landed on Japanese. So I studied Japanese. And um, uh, one thing led to another. And um, in fact, one thing, one chance operation led to many, many things. Um, but one of the things that it led to was, uh, you know, of course, I, have, I studied Japanese and I went to come to Japan. And I was very young and I didn't know much except that I wanted to... Uh, study ja contemporary art in Japan too. And um, there was one person who was very, very kind to me. And, and, and she is here, <laughs> and that is Nakaya Fujiko-san, who uh, 
who in uh, 1979 took me in. I, I knew nothing, and I was really hopeless, but she was so kind to me and let me uh, stay in her, uh, her house, and uh, I had some exposure to video art, which was an amazing new art form for me. It was very, very exciting, um, and, and that sort of uh, then again led to many other things. So I, I am still very, very grateful to uh, Nankaya-san for her generosity at that early point in my career. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, then, so you started to know the Japanese, Japan and the Japanese art history, but how, like, uh, why you become, like, uh, what to say, uh, be interested in so much the Japanese post-war art history, especially, and also, like, uh, convinced, like, uh, you made also you published the book Tsuchi, so you related this history also into the, this Tsuchi, you know? But, so could you, yeah. Um, uh, well, I, that was a long time ago when I started. And at, at that time in the US, when people uh, in the field of art history were interested in Japan, they always studied ancient art and anything after Edo period was not considered worth studying. Um, and that, that was, you know, really widespread. And so people loved, uh, you know, ancient uh, Kamakura period Buddhist sculpture. They loved uh, ukiyo-e prints of the Edo period, but there were hardly any, any publications at all. About, about anything modern. Um, and, uh, and yet I was uh, excited about contemporary art, modern art, and um, uh, I, I kind of you know, sought out opportunities to learn about it and uh, met a, a whole lot of uh, other people too who were really interesting and um, uh, did some projects on that. And, uh, one thing led to another. Um, so the Tsuchi book was my third book about uh, Japanese art. And um, one thread uh, that has been more or less consistent in my work is an interest in materiality, uh, an interest in the, um, the sensation of the work of art that exists in the world that you can touch or even if you can't touch it, you can feel like you can touch it when you're looking at materials in a photograph or uh, when you look at the surface of a painting and the encrusted, uh, uh, or, or you walk through an environment and, and feel, um, uh, the, feel the sense of the immersion in some kind of uh, installation. These aspects of materiality interest me very much. And the um, values and meanings and iconographies that proceed from those materialities. That's not really present in literature. Uh, writers do a good job of evoking materiality, but they really cede the territory to, uh, to the visual arts when it comes to the viscerally felt materiality, in my opinion. Um, so I gravitated to that aspect of art history. There are many aspects of art history. I don't really do institutional art history, although I think it's very important and I read it. Um, but I'm interested in materials. And the book on uh, Tsuchi uh, was, you know, of all the materials that you could choose, um, the Tsuchi, the, the earth, is, is somehow... Uh, fascinating for the reasons I alluded to already a little while ago that it, it kind of has, on the one hand, this inspirational sense that uh, you're touching uh, something primordial, that you're in touch with the origins of life. Um, not really, I guess, but people feel that way about Earth. 
So that interests me. Uh, at the same time, the idea of the fertility of the earth, you know, that we need the earth to grow our food to survive. We need the earth to serve as this fantastic filter that hopefully uh, can still continue doing the job of purifying um, things like dead bodies and turning them into nutrition for new life. Um, uh, at the same time that, that earth uh, soil often is very grotesque and smells bad and uh, has poisons in it. Um, so earth is very fascinating, I think. And basically that book was a project involving uh, uh, following all the different kind of earth I could find in works of art. Uh, very different kinds of earth. And then developing a taxonomy for um, you know, the many different types um, and how those differences are significant in terms that are aesthetic, but also ecological uh, values. Um, yeah, maybe I'm talking too much. No, no. Um, actually, it was because of this book, of course, that we also asked you to collaborate with us for this uh, environmental art history which starts with the 50s and which starts actually at that point, which is also the point where the new geological classification, which is suggested at the moment, the Anthropocene, is going to be set. Because uh, there are these golden spikes which were found, one in Lake Crawford and one in Beppu Bay, also in Japan, where also um, nuclear... Yeah, nuclear explosions manifested themselves in the Earth's surface, which is a for which we also say indirectly war or war activities are a big part of the environmental crisis of today. But if you could have chosen, so that's my question now, would there would there also be another point in time where you could have imagined to start setting up a history like that? And if so, when would that have been? Instead of the 1950s. Um, you can start anywhere, right? You, right? You can you can start anywhere, and uh, th these issues will there will be some some relevance, and will have a enormous determining impact. Um, you know, there are some things in the pre-war period that really struck me. Uh, you know, there's an interesting painting by Kishida Ryusei that shows the newly carved earth where uh, the, there's a construction of a road. Uh, there's a uh, book called Tsuchi, a, a novel from the late Meiji period by Nagatsuka, I think is the name of the author um, of the... It's called Tsuchi, and it's about the uh, very, very poor rural people uh, and their dependence on the, on the soil. Not romantic, not romantic at all, but you know, tied to the soil, almost slaves to the soil. That, that really struck me as you know, having a lot of potential. And then there's the war period, which you know, what um, this uh, phenomenon of scorched earth warfare is really key. And, and um, even in the post-war, the memory of this experience was very important for a, a lot of artists, including Fujita uh, Akiko. Um, uh, you know, what, what happened and what did people feel when, when the earth itself was, you know, burned, burned down um, uh, uh, and the incendiary bombs that uh, destroyed so much of the the, the city of Tokyo, uh, um, so that that too that too would be a very striking point of origin, um, uh, but but I I kind of like the fifties as a beginning precisely because of what you said the great acceleration, and how that maps onto the um, uh, the the period of high economic growth in Japan, which is a really important component of the worldwide phenomenon of the great acceleration. So I actually want to do more work in that area, uh, that period.
period, um, the 50s through the 80s, and especially the 80s, uh, where, where this kind of, um, uh, in a way, comes to a head with uh, affluence at the same time as, uh, you know, a lot of egregious problems. That, uh, so, I, yeah, I hope to do more work in that area. We would like to open the question to the public. And uh, if you have any questions to Bert Sang, <laughs> it's very special that he is here. Please raise your hand. Um, may I speak in Japanese? Uh, Bat-san, thank you very much for a very intriguing presentation. And regarding returning to Earth from the sea, it's uh, totally different from what I have imagined and anticipated. And the exhibition was also totally out of my anticipation, and that really intrigued me. And this time, the work that you showed us and the work that you sh shared with us today, many of them are not going to return to our art. It's uh, in terms of uh, pollution, kuro uh, tetsumi. It's irreversible to go, go back to Earth. So other work, tonoshi tadashi, it's plastic, cannot return to Earth. So Earth, in the book Tsuchi, there are a lot of different types of work that you have introduced in your book. And this time at this exhibition, why did you select items that could not be returned to Earth? So why did you focus on non-returnable uh, object to Earth? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. I, I, I definitely um, am using this rubric of tsuchi ni kaeru in the exhibition a much less literal way uh, than I did in my book. In my book, I really wanted to, I wanted to follow uh, earthy materials, soil itself and clay and gravel and all those earthy materials. So, um, that was foregrounded in my uh, selection criteria. But here, I wanted Tsuchi ni Kaeru to be more of a metaphor for a wider array of environmental scenarios, including, as you said so aptly, uh, the, uh, the cases where it's really difficult for these materials to be returned to the earth. If by return to Earth, we mean some kind of uh, recuperation within a uh, ecosystem that is conducive to some sort of homeostasis or sustainability or uh, life production. Um, so here, you know, there's a move away from that very literal focus on Tsuchi to something broader like an environmental art history, uh, where it's not just Tsuchi, of course, it's, it's these other elemental materials um, and, and, and many other substances as well, even though we still, um, are, we still uh, are, are faced with the problem of how these bodies sink back into the environment or these objects or these residues um, uh, and, and also this uh, perennial um, uh, idealistic romantic urge to, uh, to, to pierce through the concrete uh, and the asphalt and the plastic and, and maybe only create a vision or a fantasy of some kind of uh, integration with uh, a primal um, uh, life substance or, or materiality. Yeah, so that's kind of where I'm going. And then next, I think we've talked about also fire. Uh, more broadly, not just like a tangible material that you can touch, but also a process that involves uh, fuel and heat and light and smoke and ash. Um, so, you know, when is that good or when is it bad? Or even when it's good, 
it maybe it always has an aspect which is producing effluents that uh, contribute to greenhouse gases that are contributing to global warming. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the trajectory that I've been following. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So maybe one more person uh, was wanting to ask a question. So Thank go ahead, Thank you very please. much for your talk. I had a question about eco-anxiety that you use, the word you use several times, eco-anxiety. And as far as I know, the, 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 this, this word is quite new. And so I was wondering how did the artists you are interested in were expressing this feeling? Uh, thank you for asking about that. Um, I, I think it's an important topic, a kind of psychological, you know, sense of like wh how people feel differently. Um, uh, one thing I would say is that broadly speaking, there is a far more intense degree uh, and far more prevalent degree of echo and anxiety now than there was in the period of the 50s through the 80s, even though it was in many cases, as some of these works show, uh, the, the anxiety was um, uh, intense. Uh, but that was a time that we can now look back on and realize that, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have core samples of the uh, polar ice, ice caps that showed how fast uh, they're melting. They didn't, they didn't have, you know, the, I mean, they were focused on issues, right? Like, um, like the ozone problem. Uh, but they didn't have the sense of, uh, the graphic sense of what the future holds given the trajectory of global warming and greenhouse gases. So my feeling is that this issue is bigger now. And there is a uh, much higher degree of anxiety now than there was then. Um, uh, Martin and I were talking about how often in these works of art, the anxiety or the uh, problems seem localized. It's like, you know, Minamata sickness in Kumamoto from that factory and that bay and that fisher, th those communities. Um, that's very different from saying now that the whole you know, world is, is, is warming up or that fires are burning on you know, all continents in ways that they never burned before. So um, uh, I think that's true. Uh, but nonetheless, there is very intense anxiety and you know, we could go through different examples. I would just point to one, uh, Kudo Tetsumi, this idea of the revenge of nature that has been uh, totally uh, kind of uh, repurposed or contaminated by uh, sort of human egoism. That's the kind of rhetoric we get from Kudo Tetsumi. Uh, so in these weird sort of amateurish science experiment flavored uh, projects, there is a high uh, a, a degree of echo anxiety, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful and uh, very rich talk about uh, this. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Bad-san.